A beautiful landscape, a lovely blue lake in New York. A lake isn't just a body of water, but a complex, dynamic ecosystem full of life. It is home for many creatures. In the shallows, we'll find fish, crayfish, and other small organisms that feed the fish, including insects and plankton and plants. Life is good for these organisms, and life is good for all the people who use the lake for drinking water, swimming, boating, and fishing. But close by, in another lake, changes are happening under the surface. The difference between these lakes is night and day. The shallow zones of this lake are occupied by dense plant growth from the bottom up to the surface. Populations of fish, insects, and other organisms have changed. A new plant dominates and has pushed out the native plants these organisms need. Plus, boaters and swimmers in this area are troubled by the thick vegetation in the water. These two lakes should support similar communities. Why are they so different? Because a new plant, an invasive plant, has moved into the neighborhood. And this invasive plant is not a good neighbor. It's hydrilla. Hydrilla can completely transform underwater landscapes in a few short years. How did hydrilla get here? Why does it have such a big impact? To answer these questions, we need to follow the trail of hydrilla back to its source where it originates, in tropical Asia. Hydrilla is native to Korea, India, and parts of Asia. In its native habitat, hydrilla is considered a beneficial plant. But in other parts of the world, Hydrilla doesn't have the same herbivores and competitors. It has become a nuisance in every place it's established outside of its original range. Hydrilla has found its way to five continents, sometimes by accident, sometimes through intentional introduction. How did Hydrilla first get into these waters? Maybe a company that sells plants for aquariums accidentally released it into the water? Maybe someone who has an aquarium with Hydrilla dumped the water into a lake? In any case, hydrilla has been introduced at least twice to the United States, into Florida in the 1950s and into the Potomac River in the 1980s. These two introductions represent two different types of hydrilla, which differ slightly in their biology. The hydrilla in the northern United States is known as the Manetius biotype. This is the type that we have in New York. Hydrilla is now found in the eastern United States, much of the south, and in parts of California, Oregon, and Washington. Hydrilla has been especially invasive in Florida, where the vast majority of waterways have been impacted by this plant. In New York, hydrilla is found in several water bodies and in the past few years has been newly detected in numerous locations throughout the state. Unless it is controlled, hydrilla will overwhelm these lakes and rivers, like it has in Florida. But if we detect it early and respond quickly, we can keep hydrilla isolated and contained. What does hydrilla look like up close? You can recognize hydrilla by several unique characteristics. Its leaves grow in whorls around a long branching stem. It typically has five leaves per whorl. Look at the leaf. It has saw-toothed edges. Serrated leaves is a trait unique to hydrilla, which you can use to distinguish it from native elodius. Why can hydrilla spread so prolifically in the wild? A single tiny fragment of hydrilla can expand into a large bed of vegetation. Fragments like this break off when plants are disturbed by a boat, a passing animal, or even stormy weather. This small piece is enough to generate another plant, then another, and then a large swath that can take over a waterway. Fragments can survive drying out temporarily and live happily as floating unrooted plants until they take root in a new location on the lake bottom. As hydrilla grows, it produces structures called turians, both underground as tubers and on the plant in the water column. Above ground turians, each about the size of a pea, can float away from parent plants and sprout into new plants. Underground turians, or tubers, will sprout the following year after plants have died back. Unfortunately, these hydrilla tubers are seriously tough. These subterranean tubers can survive cold winters and live in sediments for six years before sprouting. This ability to be dormant waiting at the bottom of the lake or stream for years before growing again, 
allows hydrilla to survive chemical treatments and dry periods. Once established within water bodies, hydrilla competes with surrounding plants. Hydrilla is fast growing and thrives with both low and high nutrients. Compared to many native aquatic plants, hydrilla has relatively low light needs. This means hydrilla can grow well in the shade of existing plants and it can occupy lower, murkier depths where other native plants do not grow. Over time, through competition and shading, hydrilla is able to become the dominant and often only plant species growing in an area. Hydrilla can occupy large swaths of lakes and rivers, and its quick and spreading growth mean that water bodies are often clogged by the sheer volume of vegetation. But the impact of this plant isn't restricted to below the water surface. Hydrilla has been implicated in bird die-offs, including bald eagles. How could hydrilla possibly be linked to bird mortality? The answer is complicated and underscores the complex and unpredictable nature of the impacts of invasive species. Ducks and other water birds like eating hydrilla. Unfortunately, hydrilla promotes growth of a nasty cyanobacteria, which produces a toxin that attacks the nervous system of birds. When an eagle eats a duck, the eagle is exposed to the nerve toxin and may die. Dense stands of hydrilla also impact fish communities. Although small insectivorous fish survive better in the thick vegetation, larger predatory fish have a harder time finding food in the hydrilla matrix. How can hydrilla be controlled? Hydrilla's ability to spread, compete with, and overtake other plants, and to grow despite control efforts, make it very challenging to manage. Tens of millions of dollars are spent each year to control this nuisance plant. Therefore, detecting new populations of hydrilla while they're still small is essential. Once populations get large enough, removing or even containing hydrilla becomes extremely difficult. With larger infestations, the cost of treatment quickly becomes unrealistic for many budgets. Small hydrilla populations can be managed in a number of ways including hand pulling, physical barriers, grass carp, and herbicide treatments. For management of small hydrilla infestations, physical barriers which prevent plant growth, called benthic mats, may be installed. Benthic mats are large blankets that cover the bottom of the lake and prevent hydrilla from re-sprouting from turians. But they also prevent other vegetation from growing. Because hydrilla turians can persist for a long time in lake or river bottoms, these mats must be kept in place for many years. A fish, the voracious, plant-eating, sterile grass carp, is another strategy for controlling hydrilla. Because the carp can't get enough of tasty hydrilla, they can reduce its populations on a much larger scale than many other control options. However, the grass carp aren't picky eaters, and they will also eat all of the native plants in an area. This means that the carp are only suitable for enclosed bodies of water, such as ponds. Herbicide treatments are a popular and effective control method. Timed correctly, these chemicals are able to target hydrilla directly and can be used on larger scale invasions. However, the absolute best way to prevent the spread of this plant and its impacts is to avoid introducing it into new lakes and rivers in the first place. But how can this be stopped? New laws in New York State require people to clean, drain, and dry their boats before traveling from one water body to another. Wash stations to clean boats, kayaks, and canoes are now provided at many boat launches. Boat stewards are often there to help assist boaters. These practices prevent invasive hitchhikers from getting a ride to new places. If humans can stop moving hydrilla and other aquatic invasive species between water bodies, this will greatly help prevent their spread and subsequent impact. Next time you spend time at one of the beautiful lakes, streams, or ponds found throughout New York State, Keep your eyes out for evidence of hydrilla. If you see it, report it to the New York Department of Environmental Conservation or the Hydrilla Task Force. 
help protect New York from this problematic plant.